Yeah. I'll order the meeting of the Greenwood Common Council on Wednesday, January the 17th. If you would, stand with me for the Pledge of Allegiance. After the pledge, please remain standing. We'll be led in prayer this evening by Mark Wiley, Executive Pastor of Redeemer Bible Church. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So just before I pray, I just a word to the council members. I just want to say thank you all for the way that you serve our city and this community. So you are appreciated. And so for our prayer tonight, I'm going to pray the words of Psalm 146, which um, I think are good reminders for us always, but as particular as we go into 2024, um, a, a presidential election year, um, I think it's super important we remind ourselves of these truths. So I'm going to pray Psalm 146 for us tonight. Let's pray. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he who help, is, whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoner free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. Father, I pray for your blessings upon these proceedings tonight. I pray for these members of this council that you would just give them wisdom and discernment to give them clarity and conviction and unity. And Father, I just pray that you would encourage them in the work that they do and the work that you've called them to do. Because sometimes, Father, we can get so focused on things happening at the national level that we forget that this is where uh, people's lives are impacted by the work that's done here. So I pray that you would encourage them in the work they do, Lord, and you would bless these proceedings tonight, all for your glory. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. May we see this. Roll call. Here. Gibson. Here. Hill. Here. Hopper. Here. Lexi. Here. Manship. Here. Loan. Here. William Sassy. We have a quorum. All of you should receive copies of the minutes from the regular meeting on January the 3rd. Do I have a motion? Sure. Motion, Mr. Lexi. Second. Thank you. Second, Mr. Hopper. Any additions, deletions, or corrections? Here and end and roll call on the minutes. Petrov? Aye. Campbell? Aye. Gibson? Aye. Hill? Aye. Hopper? Aye. Lexi? Aye. Manship, aye. Aye. Minutes are approved. We'll go to eight to zero. Uh, reports, Corporation Council. Nothing to report. Anything with a controller? Nothing. All right. At this time, we have a report from the Planning Department. So, Mr. Nelson. Thanks, Mr. Campbell. Uh, Planning Department, Planning Commission meeting is scheduled for January 1st. Uh, brief. There'll be a longer version at our next plan commission meeting. Uh, that is this coming Monday. Uh, so, uh, Dave, you can uh, be excited for that. But at this time, I'd like to invite Adam up from HWC, who is our partner in this project. Thanks, Gabe. Um, and thank you all for uh, having me on the agenda this evening. As Gabe said, my name is Adam Pieper. I'm a community planner with HWC Engineering and the project manager for your ongoing conference of plan updates. A um, couple new faces on the council since I was last here in August. So I would just uh, say if you um, have at any point in this process, if you want to chat uh, about your interests and vision for the community, um, I'm certainly welcome an opportunity to sit down with you. 
Uh, as Gabe said, just wanted to keep it brief this evening, um, provide you a little update on where we are in the process, uh, and then some of our next steps coming up. Um, so since I was last year in, in August of last year, we have conducted really our um, entire first uh, round of engagement that included an in-person workshop um, in September at the library. Uh, I think we had over 100 people in attendance at that event. So we were really happy with turnout and participation there. Um, that was also duplicated uh, online with a um, survey and an interactive mapping tool. Um, we closed that survey. We had uh, over 250 responses. Um, always hope for a little more. So uh, we will have another upcoming survey um, that we'll talk about in a second. But understanding we're, we're trying to get that number up a little bit. So we'll be uh, modifying some of our outreach and engagement efforts related to that. But um, we also condu uh, conducted a high school specific survey. We had over 50 responses there. And then that interactive map that I mentioned um, received over 300 unique comments. And then there's also an ability to kind of thumbs up or thumbs down, like or dislike um, comments other people have made. And there were over 2000 of those. Um, kind of up or down votes to other community members' comments. Um, we also held a number of targeted stakeholder meetings, uh, 11 in total, um, that included over 75 participants, plus one of those was with the high school student government, which, Dave, I don't remember how many, how many it was, but it was um, at least 30 or 40 students. So that was a uh, Exciting for us, and those centered around um, topics like quality of life, housing, education, old town, uh, public safety, utilities, transportation, and so on. Uh, additionally, we were at the Greenwood Farmers Market and um, the high school football game against Whiteland. Uh, those are more opportunities for input, but really um, we see those more as just opportunities to get word out about the planning process and direct people to other online or in-person engagement events. Um, so we took all of that information and started to synthesize um, some key themes and preliminary goals that we have organized around um, the city's four pillars, public safety, infrastructure, quality of life, and economic development. We kind of added a fifth um, land use just because of how important a uh, component that is in the conference plan. Um, in the interest of time, I, I won't get into all of those uh, specific details, um, but something I think we talked about last time and you going into this was uh, an important focus on reinvestment and redevelopment in, um, in established areas of the community, but then also uh, understanding um, and using new growth areas to diversify employment and housing opportunities. Um, we have drafted a future land use map uh, and are working through um, refinements uh, to that with the steering committee and, and Gabe and his team. Um, and that will be shared uh, publicly here shortly. And then, like I said, a series of goals and strategies uh, and organized around those other topics. Um, our next key step is what we call the Big Ideas Open House. And that's going to be coming up on February 29th. Um, that will also be at the library. Uh, right now we're looking at like 4.30 to 6.30 for that. Um, and again, that's organized as an open house so people can come and go at their leisure. Um, and at that meeting, we will be sharing, like I said, future land use map, um, transportation, learning transportation recommendations, trail network, and then our series of goals and objectives as kind of a key touch point with the community to confirm um, the direction that we're on and get feedback on any course corrections or modifications that need to take place. Uh, in addition to that in-person meeting, um, we'll duplicate all of that content uh, in an online survey and create a little video introduction kind of explanation of that that will go on the project website as well. Uh, again, the project website is plangreenwood.com um, and we have updated that with steering committee materials uh, and we'll be um, finalizing some interim reports related to uh, more detailed summary of all that engagement I was just talking about, as well as um, demographic and existing condition analysis and, and some mapping there. So those will be up shortly. Um, and I think that's it for me. Again, just uh, want to emphasize that next in-person meeting that's coming up on um, February 29th. 
and uh, would certainly entertain any questions or again, if anyone um, wants to chat at any point during this process. Are there any questions for us to speak at this time? Uh, what did you say the website was? <laughs> it's plangreenwood.com. <laughs> All right, any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Thank you. I'll be sure to receive copies of uh, my report from the RDC. If you have any questions, let me know. Any other committee or board reports? All right. Hearing none, then this is an opportunity that the council sets aside for members of the public to address the council concerning the items that are on tonight's agenda. So if you'd like to do so, please step forward to the podium, state your name and address for the record, or if you're online, please speak up. All right. Hearing none, then moving on to ordinances and resolutions. Notice of intent to consider ordinance number 2401. An ordinance to amend the official zoning map adopted by reference and unifying development ordinance number 20-29, proposed rezoning of approximately 245 in nine one hundreds acres of land located between State Road 135 and Honey Creek Road and north of Smoking Road Road, sponsored by Lesky. All right, we have a motion. So, motion of Mr. Hopper. Second. Second. Ms. Gibson. Any, uh, if I wish to speak to this, the, any questions from the council? Discussion with the council. Uh, yeah, why is nobody from Lenar here to give us a presentation? I, I think there's there. someone is here. Yeah. <laughs> Were you collecting your thoughts back there? <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt you. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Mr. President, members of council. My name is Brian Tui. I'm here on behalf of Lenar Homes. I have a presentation if you'd like me to go through it, depending on the council. Mm -hmm. uh, So uh, while he's doing that, my address is 50 South Meridian. As I said, I'm here on behalf of Brock Arms, Indiana. Uh, here with me tonight is Keith Lash, Ty Reinhardt, uh, Tony Bagato, and Taylor Navarro, all with the Lenar team. And thank you for hearing our case. Um, this, is, this is a good a project. Is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I know a little bit about it, but not, not enough to speak on it. This is a, uh, mine is a, uh, it's a blue uh, first page, which I know that I have to page two. Site doesn't go all the way to 135. 
And on the south side of the site is Smoky Road Road, and it does have some frontage on Smoky Road Road. And then the east side of the site is uh, Honey Creek Road. The north side of the site is uh, surrounded by uh, residential uses, uh, commercial uses, and the Bowman family farm. The surrounding zonings include CL Commercial Large, Residential Large to the north, west is Residential Large, and Commercial Medium to the south is Residential Large, Residential Medium, and then to the east is part two in Johnson County. On the slide that you'll see after I just went through the introductory slide is a photograph of the site. Uh, when you get to about page four, it lays out the preliminary site plan for this site, which of course will have to come back before the plan commission for uh, approval of the plat. But the idea is that the north end of the site, there would be residential medium of about 24 acres. In the center of the site will be the largest section of the development, which is about 172 acres of residential uh, large, and then the south end near uh, the south end of the site will be residential median of about 48 acres. So again, roughly 245 acres, um, now less 20 for the school, so 225 acres. Overall density of the site is about 1.6 homes per acre when you mix the RL and the RF together. Um, the, uh, went before the planning commission, I think we had one person uh, come to the hearing and they were concerned about making sure that the drain tiles at this site uh, are not clogged, clogged or, or interrupted to affect the, the drainage on the west side of 135. Our engineer, Keith Lash, uh, answered that. I believe he answered. So I believe the gentleman said that he uh, responded in a way that he understood that they would be maintained, drainage would be maintained, this would not create a drainage problem uh, to, uh, for his property. If I could bring this up, I would show you pictures of these homes, um, uh, that, that they range in price at the RL from about $500,000 to uh, $600,000 in today's dollars. It is the size from about 3,100 square feet to 3,500 square feet. That's on uh, slide six, I think. Um, on slide seven, there's some other elevations of uh, RL homes. Um, and uh, again, these are just elevations of what they've been building around the Indianapolis community. On the RM uh, property, there's about 72 acres of that, approximately 145 homes. So that's about two homes to the acre in the residential medium. And those homes are anticipated to uh, cost between four hundred thousand and five hundred thousand dollars. The uh, and there's some photographs and, and elevations of renderings of those types of homes. The planning commission considered uh, something's happening here. Uh, the planning commission looked at some of the elements that you uh, need to look at in terms of the rezoning. One of them being the comprehensive plan. Site's kind of interesting. It has sort of a split comprehensive plan. The eastern side of it calls for single family residential, as this development is proposed to be. And the western side of it calls for mixed use. And interestingly, they are not developing uh, or the area along 135 is not included in this rezoning. And so it would uh, still be available for mixed use uh, should the should the owners want to rezone that property. But as I said. Uh, they're intending to stay on the property. Um, next. So this is the plan I was referring to earlier to get us oriented, what you might recall is State Road 135 would be over to your left if you're looking at that, and uh, Honey Creek Road would be over to the right, um, and then and north would be at the top, and the south would be the top, or south would be the bottom. As you can see, when I was trying to describe our L zoning, that makes up about 172 acres, the, the biggest section, about 60-some percent, I think. 
of the overall area. And then the RM zoning is at the north end and the south end, as shown in the uh, sort of tan uh, sections of that site plan. Those are the elevations of the RL homes that I was speaking of. And as I mentioned, those are expected to be between a half million dollars to $600,000 or so. There's some other elevations of RL homes. Included in our presentation, uh, your development standards, which uh, when our will meet in both the RL and the RM, that we include for the foundation, so photographs and some renderings. Of uh, VR animals. I think where I was uh, David helped me out here was that if we look at the comprehensive plan, we see the eastern side of the site that would be the right it's, uh, zone for or contemplated to be single family residential, and the western side is contemplated to be no mixed use. We uh, at, at our hearing on October 23rd for the Planning Commission. Uh, we went through the uh, statutory findings of fact about whether uh, the, it was compliant with the comprehensive plan. The staff's comment was they uh, agreed with our statement that uh, it in large part was compatible with the comprehensive plan. The staff also looked at what the current conditions and character of the structures and uses in each district, and the staff commented that the, the proposed development was in line with the surrounding area. Um, the next three criteria you look at is what's the most desirable use for the land, and uh, you said that the mix of lot sizes of the development will provide various housing options for the Greenville community, both RL lots and RM lots. And staff commented that they generally agree with our statement. Uh, the, the staff said, although the project doesn't include non residential uses, it does leave that portion along State Road 135, which I mentioned were non residential uses. And they then looked at whether the conservation of, of the property values would be accomplished. And the, uh, we, we said that we would, this would not negatively affect the property values throughout Greenwood uh, because it would increase the tax base considerably. And it's certainly compatible, we think, with existing residential uses and the 2012 uh, future land use map. Um, and I think and staff concluded that they agreed with the uh, petitioner statement. And then the last one was to consider whether this was responsible <coughs> uh, growth and development. And we uh, found or we suggested that it would allow for a residential development on a currently large agricultural site. Uh, <coughs> at that time, we thought the school was going to come in there, but, and now we know that that's going to happen. <coughs> school where kids could uh, walk to from a, from a neighborhood and uh, the staff uh, agreed with the, uh, the with our statement that uh, the future land is not called for single family uh, <coughs> mixed use and mixed use developments in the area and that this development left ample room along 135 for commercial or multifamily development. Um, the staff recommended approval. They asked for <coughs> six commitments in Lenar agreed to them all. We uh, respectfully requested that we uh, uh, could modify one of the commitments to uh, show that the trails and connections throughout the community, the residential neighborhood would be as approximately shown in the site plan because Lenar has designed these trails so people could walk through and across the neighborhood and have connectivity. And uh, I believe the staff agreed with that. Um, so to sort of wrap it up, the um, maybe the maybe the one thing before I finish here, I think it's telling is I distributed a letter from Jackie Bowman, and of course her family's selling their property, so I would expect her to be in favor of the rezoning. But uh, the letter she wrote of January 17th, which I did not have at the planning session meeting, she says that it, that her last paragraph. I wish she could be at the meeting to tell you this in person, but unfortunately, she had a prior commitment that could not be moved. But she wanted to make sure, however, that the council knew that we fully support Lenar's proposal, not just as sellers of the property, but as neighbors. So she confirmed to me that her and her mom are going to continue to live there uh, on, the, on the property while this is being developed. So I, I think that shows that 
in, in the body of her letter, they work pretty carefully with Lennar, with Lennar to create a community that they still wanted to live next door to. And I think I think that's uh, that's some, that's evidence that this has been a problem. So in summary, the uh, zoning will allow for residential development. I think that's compatible with the surrounding area. I think that will help the retail that's south of there, the program in that area in there would be more uh, rooftops if people live in that area. It's a mix of lot sizes between RL and RM. It will provide a variety of housing options. Um, it will allow development of a, a long farm site, which will, of course, increase the assessed value of the property and its tax base. Um, we think it's uh, compatible with the comprehensive plan recommendation. It reserves that real estate along State Road 135 for, for perhaps some different, even higher uh, assessed value kind of development sometime in the future. Uh, we agreed uh, in five out of six completely and one just slight modification to the staff's requested provisions. And staff recommended that it favor the recommendation to the other request. I believe our vote was unanimous at the planning commission. I think there was only eight yeah. members that time. All of the missing assumptions. I believe the only eight zero two appeal favor the recommendation. So sorry, it took a little longer, uh, but uh, we'll try to answer any questions you might have. And we greatly appreciate your uh, favorable consideration of the petition. Are there any questions for Mr. Toomey? I, I, uh, so I live in the neighborhood off Honey Creek, so I know how that traffic is already. Uh, and my concern, and you know, so this is what I'm asking about with the traffic study. In the Smoky Road, where it kind of dog legs and Tracy um, right across Honey Creek, right there, there's that like you know station, the power station, and everything. Is there any thoughts about right ways for like a roundabout going in there? Because trying to turn left in that area is very, very difficult. And also thinking about further on down the road and the, the incoming traffic that will take it all the way to Whiteland. Just kind of thinking in that that aspect of the increased traffic flow. I, I, I don't know the answer. Question. I do know there was a traffic study done, and I suspect that Abe or his team may have some uh, more information about roadway improvements. So that would come out of the schools chunk right there. Right. It, and I, I might not have the exact <clears throat> answer uh, as well. I know that our city engineer has reviewed the. Uh, traffic study that came with this, and we were supportive of this petition. Um, typically, uh, a single developer would not uh, fully construct a roundabout. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, would not be feasible for that. But that's definitely something that we can look into. A lot of that will be analyzed during the site design uh, as we work through their residential site plan. Uh, this right now, I know we have a lot of detail that was provided for us, but it is simply to get the, the overlaying zones and an idea of the conceptual plan. But uh, if, if you don't mind, uh, that's something I can follow up with you uh, maybe afterwards, uh, yeah. unless it unless you need more time to consider. No, that. it's fine to follow up afterwards. I just want to think about it in the future. If you're going to put a school there, and I don't know if it's an elementary school, or middle school, what it's planning to be, but either way, parents going in and out of there, I, I know what school drop-off lines feel like, and like trying to, again, People trying to make lifts on the Honey Creek after that, it's going to be a hot mess. Definitely. And um, so the last time we saw this was almost, uh, uh, it was a couple of months ago. And uh, at that time, the school had not, uh, to my knowledge, confirmed that they would be moving here. Uh, it was just vacant. So uh, that's some, definitely something that we will need to consider, and especially when the, the school sends in their proposed plans, we'll want to look at that circulation. Just uh, for the record, I have already discussed with the mayor the possibility of, or the need for road improvements on Honey Creek, which includes multiple roundabouts, at least more than one. And so I know there's already talk along those lines. And I, it's my understanding that the uh, Cedar Grove school system, if, if they put a school in there, would be an elementary school. So this so you know, anyway. I, 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 that's not definitive, but that's what I've heard. So. That was our understanding, also. Yeah. All right. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. I said, one, Brian, I think we talked, Lenar doesn't use vinyl at all in their 
product, so okay. you have no problems with the restriction on the product registration. So I amend uh, prohibit final use of final product. So the motion by Mr. Hopper to amend ordinance 2401 to prohibit the use of vinyl on any of the homes, vinyl siding. So on the exterior of the homes. Second. Second by Mr. Lexi. Any discussion on a motion to amend ordinance 2401? Hearing none, then roll call on the amendment to ordinance 2401. Petron? Aye. Campbell? Aye. Gibson? Aye. Hill? Aye. Hopper? Aye. Lexi? Aye. Manship? Aye. Aye. Ordinance 2401 is amended on a vote of 8 to 0. Any further discussion on ordinance 2401 as amended? Hearing none, then roll call ordinance 2401. <clears throat> Aye. 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 There are none under first reading, nothing under second reading, new business, introduction of new ordinances resolutions, ordinance number 2402. An ordinance approving parking fees for 520 South Meridian Street parking garage is adopted by the Greenwood Board of Public Works and Safety and amending Greenwood Municipal Code Chapter 8, Article 4 to establish parking fees, sponsored by Gibson and Hill. All right. Yes, good evening. Uh, so, as you know, we've got the parking garage constructed there and uh, this is one of the final steps to get it ready to open. We've got uh, security cameras are in, all the equipment for access control is in. Um, we have the contract signed tonight. It was approved tonight by Board of Works for the management by Denison. So our final step is to get the rates set, get them programmed into the system, and then test drive it before we open up. Uh, talking to Kevin, the hope is before the end of this month that we can get the rates approved, we can have that open up. Uh, start putting cars in there. All right. Any questions for Mr. Wright? There is a request to suspend the rules through second reading tonight. So, would you like to explain why that request? Uh, as I mentioned, we really want to get it open and start uh, using it. And um, since everything else is now ready, that's this is kind of the last step to, to getting us there, having that, that established. So without this, you can't charge fees if you open it. Right. Yeah. So, right. Yeah. All right. Any questions? Then I'll entertain a motion okay. to suspend the rules. Sorry, I have a question, Mike, if that's okay. Oh, yes. Go ahead. So normally at a parking garage, there's always, if you lost your ticket, you'll owe X amount. I notice we don't do that. How are we keeping people from parking a month there and coming back and saying, oh, I lost my ticket, so now I only pay, I don't know, 25 bucks for that. I would assume that I know in, in the other parking garages, basically, if you lose your ticket, you pay the maximum right. charge. So it's going to be 25 bucks. But it's, so in it's, theory, I could park a car there for a year, say I lost my ticket, come back and pay 25 bucks. We have no, we have a no overnight parking ordinance at City Lot, so the car would be towed if it was there overnight. But how do you distinguish a guest that's staying yeah, that stay with, the with the apartment folks from? I don't know that we're allowed. Oh, we have to. That's a good question because I don't think we're allowed. That. If it's a parking garage, they're paying a fee. Okay, so if I pay I, for I 24 hours of parking, I get there at seven o'clock at night. I'm going to be there until that seven is, o'clock the next question. day. You have more than seven parking. Well, not if they're the relaxed. They're not parking at 24 hours. hours. Yeah, I don't want. To. I want to hold this up so we can get going, but we need to come through this and figure out how we're going to keep people from just parking their cars. That may be there for two years. Salt with Denison on how do we track, you know, how long the car may be in there and, and figure out how to make sure that uh, if they're beyond a certain time, maybe it's just if we tell them. Any questions? Be a, a walk, maybe at the end of the end, when the last person leaves. It's working. I don't know, but Denison surely can help us. It's going to be automated. Or it's automated, but Denison will also have a person working on site during the week. Uh, 
basically kind of normal hours during the week so that if there are issues, they've got somebody in there checking it, keeping up with maintenance, doing all that. So that's part of their management. Any other questions? I have, I have a question and just a continuation of this thought. Um, Greg, um, Vincent is a parking garage management company that we are contracting with to run this garage. I'm just right, am I saying that correctly? Right? So it would, it would, I would think that in their system there would be some uh, redundancy to locate cars that park that have checked in for a ticket that hasn't been cashed in. Um, I don't know how they would locate that, I guess, but but they would have they would have to have some kind of redundancy in their system if they're parking garage. So so we'd be consulted to get an idea, and I can get back with them once I have an idea of what their thoughts are on how that how that can be tracked. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Ms. Gibson. I move for suspension of the rules through first reading. Right, we have a motion by Ms. Gibson to suspend the rules through first reading. Do I have a second? Second. We have a second by uh, Ms. Veteran. Any discussion on suspension? Hearing then roll call then ordinate on suspension of the rules through first reading of ordinance 2401. Rules are suspended through first reading and vote of eight to zero. We have a motion on first reading. Sorry. Motion by Ms. Gibson. Second? Second. Second by Mr. Hopper. Any discussion? Hearing none, then roll call. Ordinance 20, uh, 2402, uh, first reading. Bill? Aye. Hopper? Aye. Lexi? Aye. 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 Ordinance 2402 passes first reading on a vote of eight to zero. Do I have a motion on suspension through second reading? So moved. Motion by Ms. Gibson, second by Mr. Lexi. Sure. Any discussion on suspension through second reading? Hearing none, then roll call or uh, the suspension rules through second reading, ordinance 2402. Offer. Aye. Lexi. Aye. Manship. I'm sorry. Aye. 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 Rules are suspended through second reading. Do you have a motion on second reading? So, so. Motion by Ms. Gibson. Second. Second. Second by Mr. Hoster. Any discussion? Here and then the roll call ordinance 2402, second reading. Lexi. Aye. Manship. Aye. 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 A resolution declaring certain area within the city of Greenwood an economic revitalization area and qualifying certain real estate, real property improvements for tax abatement and setting the time and place for public hearing. This concerns GLA Properties Limited Liability Company, sponsored by Hopper. Mr. Wright. Oh, sorry, uh, Mr. Stone. Hey, it's okay. Um, hey, good evening. It's good to see everyone. Um, so I just wanted to provide a quick update because this was this has actually been on your agenda a couple different times. This was this abatement was actually originally approved uh, a while back, and there was the sponsor of the rep here that they'll speak here and we'll have a presentation prepared for you all. Uh, late last fall, they approached the uh, city and proactively to Have a magnetic personality. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Council, check that you don't have papers on the fire station. Or just mute them all for now. Activate insert. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if, if you're listening <laughs> online, uh, would you please mute if you have it? They're all muted. Um, okay, so um, so originally 
approved uh, last fall. Um, they, they approached the city and uh, proactively let us know the building side was going to change. Uh, the kind of review committee had made a recommendation that that should come before the council. If you remember, that was there was a meeting where that was uh, denied. This is uh, sort of a re revisit to that to address address some concerns. They have some information, uh, and from the city's perspective and the review's perspective, I think that is largely consistent with the original commitments, the investments, all those things are the same. I just want to focus it on the building side. So. Uh, I'll turn it over to them. Happy to answer any questions that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good evening, Alexis Souter, with KSM Location Advisors. We are um, quite often a, a partner on the property tax front with Spinel. Um, so good to see some familiar faces, good to see some new ones. Um, so this, yeah, this is the original presentation I was pulled up earlier. Um, so thank you, Adam, for kind of teeing that up. Um, just to what he was saying, right? This is an abatement that was approved back in March of 2021. Um, so even if you were on council in 2021, we've all slept a minute, uh, hopefully more than just one uh, since then. Um, so I thought it would be a good idea to just kind of level set, um, talk through what that original project was and how the difference in this last piece of, you know, what was at the time a four building speculative development abatement um, how it's changed, and um, and again to Adam's point, um, how investment numbers, and all of all of the numbers that go into your calculation of, of an ROI still remain the same, if if not better. Um, but I'll I'll dig into those fees. So um, so again, it just kind of provides some a, a really quick overview of the history of this abatement. So that site plan there is what was originally approved back in March of 2021, right? So the, it was a tax development at the time, we didn't have any named users, um, and it was approved with this layout that you see on this site plan. So plans for built, what is shown is building number four at the time, approximated to be 182,000 square feet ton, again, approximately nine acres. Uh, the SB1, the statement of benefits that would have been associated with this abatement request um, would have included the investment for that that building to be $8.5 million. Um, as you guys know, but for those watching at home, um, anybody going back and reviewing minutes, um, that 8.5 then is then what is pulled through to the statement of benefits as just the estimated investment. And then that's often, that's going to be the figure that's going to be used to calculate abated savings, right? Um, so the first three, uh, the first three spec buildings, if you will, um, the layout and, and the size have changed over time since March 2021, but they were all done within the parameters that were put on each in each respective statement of benefits form. Um, Scanel has been a longtime partner, uh, development partner uh, with the city of Greenwood. And so because the scope of, and again, which happens quite often with speculative development, the layouts have just kind of have just changed, right? So you kind of have this last puzzle piece and because the the spec of building number four changed enough. You know, Scanel again, just being a, a long, long time partner with the city, you know, and us as, as their property tax, um, their property tax partner, really value transparency. You guys should know what's you know being spec for that last for that last parcel. Um, so with transparency in mind, and then again as their property tax uh, partner, we. So we never want to run into any compliance issues. You know, we've been um, we've been at enough council meetings where not necessarily Scanel, but another project, you know, is missing the mark on that statement of benefits, and we just we never want to put the city or or Scanel right in that position. So we felt uh, that it very much warranted coming back before you, doing a formal amendment process to the original resolution from 2021, so that we can account for the changes and and how this you know, this remaining parcel is going to look. Um, we've included some information here, again, just a testament to the longstanding partnership between Spinell and the city of Greenwood. Um, as it relates to just this, um, that whole industrial uh, development back there, where it's still Commerce Center, um, there's been quite a bit of investment that Spinell has made that, um, you know, that has that come out of pocket for and have not asked the, the city to subsidize at all, um, just to the tune of, Close to six million dollars in road <laughs> improvements 
um, you know, constructing, widening, improving all of the roads back there in the park, um, and certainly uh, utility and, uh, and other infrastructure improvements have, have come along with the, the really large uh, development back there. So to kind of stack, um, stack the 21, 2021 project to the 2023 project, um, this is this is the revised site plan, right? So you kind of see how building ones two and three uh, changed just marginally, um, but you can see, hopefully you can see on my site plan there, um, how that's changed in comparison to if I go back here, right? You kind of see what that original that original step development was going to look like. Um, so again, kind of stacking those side by side. I, you know, we just tried to kind of compare. Okay, the last the 2021 project was nine acres, 182,000 square feet. Uh, you've got some pavement area there that would have been associated with that um, with that spec. Now here here we sit in 2024, <laughs> not 2023. Um, that that remaining you know land to be developed is going to account for close to 43 acres. You've got a primary building on that on that lot um, to the tune of 87 490 square feet. You've got a secondary structure on spec or not spec, um, you know, planned on that site, and then you've got um, significantly more pavement area. So working with um, working with the property director director at KSM Location Advisors, working very closely with Adam on how to kind of key in on what the estimated AV will be. And I think that was really kind of the, um, when we came before you in November, December, end of last year, I think it was really kind of the AV that, um, that was really in question and it, it, it's gonna change that much. How, you know, what, just, what does that mean for, uh, for the estimated assessed value? So using comps, again, working really close with Adam, we've, been able to arrive at a total estimated AV. You'll see they're kind of in that last bullet of 12.55 million. Um, again, that's that's more than that 8.5 that was originally spec'd and would have been on that SB1 back in 2021. So our request um, and really is that yes, our estimated AV is coming in higher. Um, there, we are not seeking any sort of additional incentive on and above that. Um, again, for like kind of getting into the weeds on all things property tax abatement, because that 8.5 is on the first page of the SB1, it effectively gets capped um, when we go to file CF1 compliance filings, et cetera. So we are not seeking abatement on any AV that will come in above and beyond that 8.5. So the ask is really to you know kind of make this formal amendment same abatement schedule as was approved back in 2021. Um, you know, we've, we've worked with the city long enough. Um, we kind of devised this abatement schedule, which uh, you, hopefully you will notice that years one through three are at 80%. If uh, if it is a standard abatement schedule, you're, you usually see 100% in year one. We recognize that there's some value there, right? That we don't have 100% abatement in year one. So um, we've, we've carried that abatement schedule all the way through. So in terms of next steps, we really just wanted to take the time that, you know, maybe wasn't taken back in November, December, when, when the, uh, when the first amendment was, was discussed, make this presentation, introduce, kind of reintroduce it, answer any questions that you have, um, and then just work through the typical approval process to get the, um, to get the amendment approved. Right. Any questions? I have to say, I appreciate the work you, uh, your company's put into addressing our concerns. So, uh, any questions at this point, comments? So, does the new proposal with a freight terminal, does that mean that more truck traffic will come through that area as opposed to what would have been there before if it would have just been a box with Whatever widgets are inside the box. I'm gonna I'm gonna let Justin Olshak, who's the development manager with Spinellus, kind of address the, the truck traffic and what would have been there yeah, yep. before. So again, Justin Olashik with Spinell Properties representing the uh, owner developer on this project. So we did update our traffic impact study as a part of our entitlements with uh, the planning staff, um, just so we knew what kind of impact this set user was going to have on what we had previously assumed and 
it fell within what was initially assumed in the initial traffic study back in 2020, 2021, um, as far as our, our best guess on a speculative basis at that time, what, what could be generated from the site. So um, it would not be any anything different than what was previously approved. All right, any other questions? Yeah, I just mean well, less enthused by the project as a whole than I would have been before. Um, and I know we have a new assessor, but I still am not, I can't say that my confidence in them actually assessing it to what it's supposed to be assessed at uh, will be done. But uh, yeah. All right. What, uh, can you make any commitments if it comes to under the eight and a half million? Any commitments? Yeah. I mean, it, um, oh, I mean, obviously the uh, the abatement benefit is going to be. I, I, it would be less because of that. Um, but we would also get less. So I. I, I <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. Just going to pull. Sorry, just going to pull this back up. I mean, we the con property that we are that we were using is 800 Commerce Parkway, and I mean there are. I work with. Our property director, property tax director, all the time. I mean, that it's almost an apples to apples comp, and I, I think Adam, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think validated that. Um, so again, I, I, I understand. I completely understand what you're saying from a from the use, and you know that it's you know you've got the paving out there. But I, to break it out, I mean, I, I guess I kind of glossed over it between the land, the building, the paving. I mean, those are all. Those are all have all been arrived at. I mean, with comps and you know, we we're not messing with the SB one itself. But you've, you've got you've got the cost per square foot for the land building and paving, and to get it to that twelve point five. So. Councilor's question is whether or not you would commit to that twelve million five hundred and fifty thousand five hundred dollar figure in the event that the assessor came in under that number. I mean, I think you'd have to have. I, I think it'd be the, it's the assessor, right? I don't know that we. How, how, I guess how would you how would we commit to the twelve? Would be a minimum payment in lieu of it would be a minimum payment. We've, we've done this on several. So then to work on work a pilot for just this last yeah. piece. Okay. Right. So uh, I, I actually think there's two potential options. The one would be an agreement on a minimum assessed value, so essentially an appeal floor. So uh, there's precedent for that. There's examples we can share that have other Johnson County uh, properties on it. The way it works is, you all know there are appeal restrictions in the <clears throat> tax abatement structure, the, the resolution now. This would essentially work to um, any assessments lower than that are required to basically go to that number. Okay, so it's kind of a lesser, uh, lesser or greater than good. Secondly, the only other thing I would say is, uh, there are, I think, opportunities when you get to com the compliance aspect of this, because we're still talking about an enabling statement of benefits. So at that point in time, you would have a fully assessed project that would be reported on the compliance form. That would provide you all an opportunity basically each year to, to sort of re reevaluate this based on these commitments as well. But I would say either one of those would be opportunities. Anything else, Mr. Harper? All right, any other questions or comments? If, if I may, I, yes. I'd like to just share a little bit more about the, the proposed tenant. So um, it's a long-term partner of ours, uh, also a long-term partner in, in Greenwood. Um, again, with this being a, a build a seat user, we have the luxury of knowing um, their employment numbers and just generally what the investment they're making on a, uh, a, a salary basis. So. Um, these numbers are a little dated since they weren't required as, as far as this abatement goes, but this was April of 22, and actually the, the project has grown in scale since this time. Um, but they'll, they'll be providing 163 jobs, average hourly sal salary of $30, um, average uh, um, salary position of 82000 a year. Um, they're fully... Um, benefited as far as their medical medical coverage, um, 
it's uh, a 15 year lease that they would be uh, executing with us. So it's a long term tenant. So in addition to the tax benefits, you're getting your full full tax amount for five years. There's two five years extensions at the back end. Additionally, you're inserting a, a great amount of um, of uh, of money into the, the citizens of Greenwood because quite frankly, this it's higher. It, it's the tenant that you want here. You know, it's the one who's paying the high wages and it's more than you would have gotten out of the, the building for even at a, a larger square footage. So um, I just wanted to, to bring that up to the, the council's attention and uh, just for the consideration. All right, thank you very much. Any other comments or questions from the council? All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your time. All right, next, resolution 2402. The resolution approving certain amendments to the East Side Economic Development Area. This is concerning Pulte Del Webb project sponsored by Campbell and Hopper. Tenants, Adam again, I, I'm here really on behalf of the next two, on behalf of the Green Redevelopment Commission. Just wanted to provide, I know this has been a well, both of these have been well documented projects. Um, uh, the next two, both are under project agreements that both had received unanimous approval of the Green Redevelopment Commission in the form of the declaratory resolutions, and then both received uh, unanimous approval at the Plan Commission uh, order of fact that's really ultimately being codified as part of these uh, resolutions. Um, the, this is not the final step in either creation of these allocation areas. The uh, tentative date right now for the public hearing would be the March 12th Redevelopment Commission meeting, which is at 430. We're preparing the final notices and tax impact statements for those, that, and that would be where we would uh, request any questions or comments from the overlapping taxing units to attend that public hearing. They have any final questions. So this is officially step three of a four-step process. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have about uh, the actual tip. And then relative to uh, the resolution 20, uh, 2402, the representatives here from Pulte that maybe has to speak to any questions you may have about their specific site plan. Are there any questions for Mr. Stone at this time? All right. On resolution 2403. The resolution approving certain amendments to the East Side Economic Development Area. This is for Indris and Hauser and the Unicorn Project sponsored by Campbell and Hopper. Uh, ditto of what he just said. All right. Yeah. Same thing? Yes. All right. Well, all, all of Mr. Stone's comments on resolution 2402 and <coughs> resolution 2403. Any questions from the council? Very none. And moving on, miscellaneous business. Uh, this is a second opportunity that we allow the members of the public to address the council, this time concerning items that are not on tonight's agenda. So if you'd like to do so, please step to the podium, state your name and address for the record, or if you're online, please speak up. Hearing none, then moving on, council miscellaneous business. As you can see, we have a long list of conflict of interest. Um, all of you should have received a copy of that. What we're going to do, uh, since all of you have a copy, we're going to, uh, first of all, any questions or concerns about any of the conflicts of interest that you've received? Then what we'll do is we'll entertain a motion to accept all of these and then take a, a voice vote on those. And a copy of this list will be attached to the minutes of our meeting. So, do I have a, any other any comments or concerns, questions? I would just say that uh, I would abstain from mine. Uh, otherwise, yeah. yeah. Okay. We're going to do them all at once. <clears throat> I'm just saying. I, I would <laughs> probably abstain. 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 Yeah. All right. So, we, we will note that if you, if you, on this list and have a conflict of interest that uh, your vote for the, the affirmative is for all but your own or you're abstaining from your own. How's that sound? Sounds good. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, sounds good. All right. I, do I have a motion to accept all of the conflicts of interest as presented? 
Certainly. Ms. Betron makes the motion. Have a second. Second. Second on Mr. Lexi. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Likewise. They are approved unanimously except for the abstentions as noted. Um, any other miscellaneous business from the council? All right. Any miscellaneous business from the corporation council? No. Controller? No. Mayor's office? We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.